thank you all. I'm Chris Emerson. A um, bit of background about me. I've been with Brian Kay for 18 years. Uh, my formal education was all in business, but I actually worked as a software developer there for the first 10 years of my career. Quick bit about us and our, and our pricing history, and I'm sure most of you at this point have a pricing function and you're wondering why I'm giving you, why I'm going through this at all. But there are certain things that we did at the beginning and throughout that led to the, the transformation, if you will, in mission that we've done over the past, say, five years. So back in 2002, we, uh, and I, at that point, it was a team of really just me, uh, wrote our financial dashboard, which ultimately we wound up uh, licensing to Redwood Analytics and resold, completely cost, uh, covered the cost of development on that. But by 2003, had uh, written our cost allocation system and had our first profitability metrics. Uh, we also created our first round of pricing tools, including you know, fixed fee and fixed fee by phase tools. By 2008, as you know, most of you know, um, the markets were beginning to shift, RFPs were becoming very common, you know, fee estimates, budget requests, all of that was becoming very common. And so you know, we, we got involved as, as people that understood you know, the firm's internal cost structure and our financial um, structure and what our goals were around it and how the different ways of staffing you know, can affect profitability. We became the ones that were tasked with doing all of that. At that point, there were two of us. But in addition to that, you know, we realized very, very early on that you know, we could come up with any billing arrangements that we wanted to, whether or not it actually worked out for the firm, uh, was a result of the project management you know, and the execution that occurred and the ability to manage to those arrangements. And so we started in on that project management path really at about the same time that we started doing alternative fees in any scale. By 2010, you know, this was becoming such a common event for us, you know, it was multiple times per month that we were going through this, that the firm decided that they wanted to dedicate focus and, and uh, people to being able to do this. And so at that time, there were three of us uh, in the practice economics group. By you know, 2011, 2012, uh, we were starting to go and attend RFP interviews. By um, you know, 2013, we were beginning to get directly involved uh, with client <laughs> projects. And by just this year, we brought in our first non-legal client to the firm. And we're going to talk a little bit about how and why that happened. So one of the things we recognized very early on, you know, in the beginning there was me on the business side and the other two people that had joined me were on the technology side, but there was a recognition that in order to be able to do this well, we needed a lot of different talents involved in it. And so you know, what you can see here now is, is the composition of the group today, but um, you know, year over year we generally added two to three different people you know, coming into this group, it's about an 18-month learning curve, learning the business of law. Even if it's a lawyer coming in, it doesn't really seem to matter. It's at least an 18-month learning curve to begin to really understand how to offer good advice, you know, back to our lawyers, our partners, or our clients. We've expanded our skill set uh, just recently with the actuary, and, the, and we actually have a full-time statistician. I'll show you some examples of why we went that uh, route. But we've also are now today looking at bringing a data scientist in. You know, you think some of the earlier conversations that you know we heard here today and why law firms sit on vast amounts of, of text data that you know are effectively locked away in our document management systems, and we're looking for better ways to be able to extract that information out. Um, we'll also talk a bit about how the, the, the oh, technologists are leveraged in this, but it is generally in the delivery and the creation of, of client-facing um, you know, workflows or applications, document automation systems to be able to deliver our legal services under the business models that we create uh, in the, under the pricing part of it. All right, so you know, we had started really fundamentally both from you know, an internal financial awareness, you know, teaching lawyers the business of law, you know, and then into pricing. 
And you know, the pricing part of it matured substantially as we went along. You know, we certainly recognized the, the necessity of knowledge management and support of pricing. But you know, it then also grew down. We, you know, we recognized that we had to be able to deliver project management. There was an earlier question about project management. I didn't really raise my hand very high. But our perspective on this is it needs to suit the opportunity. Um, you know, project management as a discipline, you can be you know, very detailed, have lots of checklists, lots of documentation around the whole thing or it can be as lightweight as the you know, opportunity necessitates. And so in some instances, this is really just uh, automated reporting and alerting, but it can also go all the way to the other extreme where you know, you're trying to manage individual tasks, manage them against a budget, be able to do, handle the communication to you know, potentially co-counsel, the client, uh, sometimes the court. And so it can be as sophisticated as you want it to be. Um, you know, you think about the process improvement part of it, that has arisen primarily as a result of the RFPs and the opportunities to be able to partner with clients on portfolios or opportunities of scale. And that portfolio doesn't necessarily just mean, um, you know, all homogenous work. It can be anything from the commoditized section all the way up to the cream section and being able to develop you know, processes to be able to manage at all levels of complexity. Uh, we've also gotten involved really, you know, and this is fundamentally, with most of the major firm activities, the annual rate setting processes, you know, not only you know, non-partner compensation, but partner compensation. All of those processes have been written into you know, our financial dashboard and the technology platform we provide to the firm. You know, lateral hiring analysis, I'll tell you a little bit in a second about our partnership with professional development but also the strategic planning process as we went through that exercise this year. Each year, that each time the firm goes through it, I find that we're more and more involved with it and there's more and more, unfortunately, you know, initiatives that we're then expected to deliver on. But then there's also the client involvement. This year we uh, created a consultancy to begin to directly help um, both clients and non-clients of the firm. I mean, it can be anything from, you think about all of the companies that don't have electronic billing systems and are just sitting on you know, mounds of PDF invoices and frankly don't really have any idea of how they could begin to develop an, an effective alternative fee program within their organization. They don't know exactly where their spends are. Uh, we've been able to partner with them on all of that. All right, so you know, most of this, you know, if you're if you're looking to grow a multi-focus, multidisciplinary group, I mean, most of this makes sense. The things that I found, though, most specifically are, are critical is the focus on the the team building. You know, when you bring lawyers into a group like this, and this is no offense to any lawyers in the room, they tend their their entire ex, uh, experience is based on being an individual performer, and you're now trying to bring them into a team context and teach them to leverage the strengths of others and understand that there are people that are going to be able to do things faster than they're able to do it and so recognizing those opportunities. In terms of, and these examples are just really a tiny handful of the different kinds of things that we've done, but you know, around portfolios, being able to do decay rate projections, you know, this is a benefit of having an actuary and, uh, and a statistician in there and recognizing that you know, legal matters do not follow a normal distribution. You know, they are inherently skewed to the right because you can't have less than zero hours worked or less than zero, hour, you know, zero days in the, in the duration of a matter. So by definition, it's going to be skewed to the right. And so then you start to think about it, you know, in terms of pricing and really on this side over here, this is, uh, you know, like if you think about pricing capped fees and you have the distribution of all of the different, you know, the, the work the firm has done for the same type of matter, what is it that drives it from the left to, to the right? And it, one of them is probably, you know, complexity of it. Um, and so beginning to understand, you know, as an example, how complex is this one versus you know, the bulk of the firm's experience in it? Because that begins to help inform you about where, if you're gonna do a fee cap, where should your fee cap be? You know, I'd be one that would argue that under a cap situation, your average or your median is probably not where you wanna put your cap. It doesn't allow for any risk management. 
Um, this is sort of a non-intuitive example in terms of project management or process improvement. You know, we've done you know, the, what you probably would have expected, you know, matter management systems, you know, not only for Brian Cave's work with a particular client, but uh, that all of the different law firms that that firm, uh, that, that company utilizes, creating one platform for them to be able to manage everything. But in this case, you know, it was looking at a portfolio of work and beginning to understand who are our, who are our strong performers, who are our weak performers. And the weak ones, not necessarily with the intent of you know, getting rid of them, but being able to figure out, okay, who could use additional mentoring? Who, who has a, a window into you know, this particular phase of, of you know, this matter that could offer mentoring or advice? Or we could go and interview and understand, how, what are you doing differently to be able to perform this? This, this task faster or more efficiently. Um, you know, it also, you know, the diversity and experience helps in terms of, you know, legal service delivery. Um, you know, in this particular instance, we partnered with a client. We went in, we met with uh, their chief legal officer, documented out what the objective of it was. This is for a contract management platform. Um, this was a company that had no infrastructure. In fact, their very first step was to figure out what contracts the company had ever entered into and quit paying the ones that were no longer in place. Uh, they really had no handle on it at all. So beginning to get legal involved as part of the approval process, but also being able to keep track of you know, terms and dates and you know, what position did they take and when was it going to come up for renewal so that they could uh, all, you know, be able to figure out if they wanted to go out for an RFP and get better pricing, you know, next time it came around. But ultimately, it translated into a software-based solution that our lawyers are involved with as part of that contract review as well. Um, so changing culture takes time. This one, you know, I think everybody recognizes. We certainly run into the same thing. You know, we take, we we're capitalizing, frankly, on the disruption in the market. We wouldn't exist if you know, the, the legal market uh, looked more like it did you know, pre-2007. But the challenge is, is you know, attorneys are very skeptical individuals. Um, and so what we've ultimately needed to do is begin to, we created an associate business academy to start to have a more, a better informed, better equipped associate ranks that you know, over time as they become partners, are going to become um, better equipped, better enabled to be able to work in this particular market. And so this is just an example of the, the junior curriculum. We also do things like associate hackathons. I don't know. I think we're one of the first firms to try this, but it's been incredibly well received. You, you get uh, your associates together, you break them up into teams, and you get them to think about what is the, the you know, what ideas do they have to transform the delivery of legal services or to, you know, seize an, a new opportunity for the firm. And then the next day they go back and they present to, uh, to the group. And what you see here is exactly that. But overall, you know, the client fundamentally, my experience is, is the most effective agent of change. You know, you th we, had a, we had an instance where there was an entire portfolio of work that was being performed, and we had a very difficult time with one of our offices in, in getting them to use a technology, a workflow system that we had put in place. And so what we found, you know, in spite of trying to use the, the stick on them, ultimately what worked best to get them to adopt this is to open up that system for the client, for them to be able to come in and see all the work that we were doing. Uh, it turned out that in that particular instance, communication was also an issue. There were literally hundreds of different matters in this, and the client's inbox was totally full, as were our lawyers' inboxes. This was litigation, and so you know, entries from the docket system and everything else. What we ultimately did is moved all communications into this system, which then drove our lawyers into it. They didn't want to be embarrassed. They made sure the data was always correct in it, and the client was thrilled. So I, I just would always, you know, leverage the client whenever you can. Um, we talked a bit about, you know, the rise of procurement in the U.S. You know, we have this new entity, CLOC, the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. Essentially, it's the legal operations people in some of the biggest companies in the U.S. You know, they tend to be Silicon Valley, the big banks, some of the big power and energy companies. And they've now started to... Um, 
you know, work together to create you know, outside counsel billing guidelines, standardized approaches to things. They don't tend to be very favorable to us as law firms, but you know, there is an opportunity for us to be able to begin to partner with them. You know, they're often interested in many of the same things we are, you know, leveraging technology better, optimizing the internal performance of the law department, having better approaches to be able to you know, um, predict legal spend or greater transparency in legal spend. And so I tend to regard all of these new roles as potential allies in that because they're going to understand better what it is as operational people that we're trying to do. And you cut through the skepticism, most of them are not lawyers, and so you cut through the skepticism and the need to train that internal company audience on why this matters. Um, this one, uh, this was from a buddy of mine who works at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. He's in an operational role, but you know they also do want to partner with us. They, you know, the the operational people inside the law department don't find it any more fun uh, to try to you know beat budgets out of our lawyers than we do to try to get them to prepare them. And so they, there is usually an open invitation that if you have somebody in a pricing or other operational role, to have them join in on the discussions. So overall, you know, our approach to it is we try to measure everything that we do. I mean, we, initially we were a cost center, and so you know, we had to be able to sell our value to the firm in order to be able to continue to grow. And we, literally over five years, we went from three people to 18. I was in front of the EC earlier this year you know, explaining that you, they can expect us to continue to grow by three plus people per year for the foreseeable future because the demand is always outstripping our supply. But you know, this is one of the examples that we've used internally to be able to demonstrate it. The, and what we found is the matters that we get involved with from a pricing, a project management, a process improvement uh, basis, every year we have outperformed the firm for the stuff that we haven't been involved with. Not only on the alternative fee side of the house, but also on the hourly side of the house. And it's by significant, you know, double digit, uh, differences in margin. It's just very, very significant. Uh, the other way that we've also often quantified it is, you know, the positive margin that was generated as a result of our activity, how does that compare to our internal annual budget? This particular year it was 11 times we've had as many as 16 times our annual budget. Obviously the bigger we get that's a harder number to keep up with, but it also is part of why we're continuously out there promoting, trying to be the change agent within the firm and getting uh, us and getting the lawyers and the partners and the clients to take advantage of our services. But at this point now, you know, we also have created this consultancy side and so we're going to try and use our internally gener our revenue that we generate from these external opportunities to also help subsidize our growth. Um, so benefits to the law firm, I mean most of these are very, very obvious. Um, you know, the bottom one is the one I had just said. The one that tends to be I have to explain to lawyers a little bit, but you know, if you can put a piece of technology or you can put an improved process in front of a, you know, in between the law firm and the client, the relationship tends to be stickier as a result. Um, and it's not, you know, the funny thing, I mean, everybody's probably not surprised that the relationship between the client and the firm is stickier. But the other secondary benefit to the firm is usually the relationship of the firm to that particular partner becomes stickier because their, that, their client base, their work now becomes a little bit less transportable. Uh, we don't you know, advertise it to the partner that way when we're offering these solutions, but we know that's a secondary benefit. Um, in terms of value to the client, I had no idea there was a transition there. You know, it's, it, we're partnering with them to solve their business objectives. I mean, we fundamentally understand that you know, what the law firm is providing is not you know, uh, legal, we're not solving legal problems for them. We're trying to solve and help them achieve business objectives. Oftentimes our lawyers don't necessarily understand or want to ask the questions of what business objectives are we trying to succeed or 
how do you measure success or what metrics do you have in place to be able to evaluate it? Sometimes the law department doesn't either and that creates an opportunity for us to help define that conversation for them. But it is solving a wider variety of business objectives. You know, oftentimes we find that the business itself perceives the law department's value better. You know, we, we get involved sometimes just to even create scorecards and metrics on law department performance back. Or we look for ways to be able able to you know, enable legal to um, make the business more competitive. I mean, a really simple, obvious example of that is in banking. You think about any of your borrower paid work. You know, to the extent that the law firm fees are predictable and lower than what other banks are able to achieve, you, you know, by enabling that kind of predictability, you make the company more uh, marketable. You know. So there's a lot of different opportunities there. Yeah.